right, recording the screen. Lean and lean, mean, means. I got the means. If I have the means, the attentional fortitude and well without to drop back in and not hoard it all. If I can keep the focus in the right space, it'll become automatic eventually, unless it's not my place. My place might be that I always have to do what some have to do, which is like constantly keep it balanced consciously. I don't have to do that. I stay standing on my own. Unconscious mind will do that for me, but my unconscious mind will not face my voice in the right spot in the body. I want to do that. I got to do that for my own way. No way. Home way. What's going on? Are we in like two things? Did I start wrong meaning? Okay. Hey, can you hear me? I can indeed. Oh, and I can hear you. Okay. I'm just in a weird little window. Ah. Yeah, no, it took forever for this thing to open up, so. If, yeah. they, if you saw glitches on your end, I, your computer's just being slow. Okay, at the moment there's two of you. There's one large of you in the center, and then a smaller of you off the corner with a little me underneath. That's that might be on. <laughs> might be, uh, might be on my end. I try to, oh, what if I minimize that? Okay, hold on, I can work this out. You gallery okay i fixed it that was on me so perhaps the glitch okay. is surmounted and uh maybe in uh optimism yeah i'm gonna do what you're doing and light up some uh yeah slightly uh well i was gonna say slightly uh slightly you know diluting the problem solving capacities but not necessarily Personally, does... my baseline is such that it improves my problem-solving capacities up to a certain point. Mm, There's no, no. definitely a curve. There's definitely a curve there. Yeah, so right. So you get to a peak and then it goes downhill, but up to that point. Right. Yeah, no, this is true. I think for me, I think it's downhill immediately if you include within the sphere of the notion of capacities, motivation, and willingness. So my, yeah, capacity is like, I'll be more willing to do this later when I'm not stoned. That kind of <laughs> minimizes my capacity, but more in a metal way, in a way I could, you know. Okay, whereas One, see, with me, it's exactly the opposite. It's, uh, a certain amount of my actual motivation to do anything is just overcoming inertia from chronic disabilities, so. This helps with that. Uh -huh. Inhaling mm. a bunch of creative drive that also alleviates physical pain is pretty useful. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And I can see how that could alter the gestalt of the motivational, you know, yep. balance. Understood. But again, I'm... that's coming from a baseline of uh, that's coming from a baseline of considerably reduced ability compared to most people, I think. Or at least considerably impaired ability, not if not actually reduced. And mm. just more standing in between me and getting things done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, yeah, yeah, understood. Understood. <sighs> it's the, I, I have the same issue with you in terms of being really good at the hardcore necessities. And yeah. like, beyond that, the, uh, Rest feels a little bit like gravy, and mm -hmm. anything can be just about as well deserved rest. Yeah, perhaps it is, as we've uh, as we've discussed before. It's certainly no uh, no <laughs> no qualms with balancing the you know going which direction in terms of help when and yeah when and why. I mean, it's funny. You've uh, you've actually been on my mind quite a bit this last week. Oh yeah. Cause, uh, because I've been, of all things, uh, working my way through the audible version of Atlas Shrugged. Right. Which is like a full work week of reading, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully you can, you know, make some beats or something while it's going down in audible, oh, in sure. audio form. Which is nice, but... Sure, absolutely. But, uh... It's so weird. Like... It took yeah. me a long time to get to a point where I would read this thing. But so many people hate Ayn Rand's work. And so many people are just so mad about about her books that it's it's hard for me to ignore that opinion. If a lot of people are mad about it, then it's got to be something worth at least being angry about. 
Yeah. And then I, I go read these two books, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, and I'm like, okay, but actually, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I think they're mad at, which is reasonable, the haters, if you will, is the confident dismissal energy of the objectivist yeah. sphere that embeds a little bit of a medium message merge that was really unjustified. It was a, she didn't see, I think, um, and I think this is a, a, the kinds of really good criticisms you get from Michael Malice, sm small oh, objectivists, in terms of her sure. inflating a few spheres and certainly not, not considering style of communication as within her sphere of um, of playful creativity if she has the goal of communicating her uh, ideas well. Although I'm sure if you asked that she was of the opinion that the best way to communicate the ideas was as clearly as possible and you know those who got it clicked into it and those who didn't did it. I just hate the black and whiteness of it and there is so much beautiful complexity and gray in different levels of uh, critique and different levels of rebuttal that do happen at the, the I think, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there's certainly a lot there, and I can understand the lifelong hesitation, really. But there's a tremendous depth to it and a tremendous amount of integration she does in a lot of yeah. spheres. I mean, she actually like emerges in epistemology and metaphysics reasonably well. No, I agree. I think. And kind of, uh, it's- I, I very yeah. much agree. Like, there's, there's an interesting twist that appears to, without, I'm not, without I think actually doing it, but it appears to resolve the classical is ought distinction. Like, mm. okay, That's you know, me, it, yeah. it's, it seems to try to. I don't know if it successfully does, but it does to my own satisfaction for pragmatic reasons, which is fine. Do have to assume that you're, you as a human, have preferences of some kind. So there's an ought there automatically mm. but given that premise it is then possible to make derivations of what should proceed based on the facts on the ground yeah yeah perhaps that the preferences are so deeply contextual and that context is so eminently endlessly unfolding unknowingly and innovatingly it makes the that uh, to me a really really beautiful almost universally useful heuristic but not a first principle and she takes it as first sure. principle. But I'm, I, you know, I don't know. I, it could be really useful. It could be so useful that treating it as such is better than. Well, what's interesting is the thing, the reason that I keep thinking on this as I read is that there's a lot of convergence between that and the way I conceptualize, uh, God, what is his name? Hold on a second. I'm being hollered at. No worries, no worries. The name will emerge on its own surge among the mind as the mind purges. It's doing before. Oh, I'm distracting him with my lore. Galore. I wonder if his mind can multitask. Can he both hear me and the person he's actually talking at? Are the headphones even in? Questions, mysteries, endless. Where do we begin? <laughs> okay, a sign. A meaningful smile. Stop for a while, starts again. Headphones are in and out again, my friend. But I keep rapping, don't stop tapping. Dash, it doesn't stop, no gaps. Keep it going, snowing down forever with ideas fractally dismantled, dismayed, showing, playing playfully, serious play. But we growing the same, see? Like a snowflake, be growing all the time, pretty much symmetrically, except not eventually. It's just gonna fall and dissolve. New forms, new parts, new holes. We resolve, solved the equations we have, except do we get from an is to an ought? We have, possibly. Maybe inevitably, time is an is to an ought. <laughs> Ooh. To the extent Speaking that conscious beings. <gasps> Consciousness adds ought to is intrinsically almost through I our experience. Right. So. Then who are we to? Talking of is as an oughts and snowflakes. You know it's like 80 friggin' degrees here right now? Yeah, I, I do, yeah. actually. My mom happens to be in Florida at the moment. Yeah, it's absurd. <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's, it's almost, almost January and yeah. it's hot. Anyway, so. mm, 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I still, whenever I hear that move made, like, I have always too quick, like, react. I'm very reaction, I'm very antithesis on this, and I make presumptions, which is something like, you know, weather is, um, and I know you're not making these, but I'll, I'll make that. I'm going to straw man your argument, and then we can steal man out from there. But something like okay. weather, if you're interested, and we can keep with the is odd thing. Too, but um, just to hit this a garden path real quick, that weather is uh, climate, and that anthropomorphic uh, influences are implied in unintuitiveness of the fluctuations for us. For me, considering the fact that there's seems like po- all these possible causal causal energy inputs for micro systems such as 25 year ups and downs that are having something to do with geologic or solar systematic uh you know moves yeah so those two things and i'm wondering if people like the anthropomorphic and again i'm i have so many smart people i super super respect are like climate anthropomorphic anthropogenic climate change is legit and not something to be this is the question of course, it doesn't imply what we ought to do about it. And really smart people can say this is a problem, but carbon tax is a far cry from the way to think about it. Um, Very much agree. Yeah, so those are just some, some one of the arguments off. that I think one of the arguments I think would be made um, by a rand in this era is the mm. uh, the goal is to. It's the same argument that would be made by a uh, by a Buckminster Fuller. If you're mad about the environment, create a product that does the same job better in every conceivable way. Outcompete it with a superior product. If solar uh, panels suck, make something that works better. Yeah, I feel if that. I feel that. If solar panels suck, make something that works better. You know? Yeah. It's, if gasoline cars suck, make something that works better. That people can afford. That people can have access to. And I bet you that if it is objectively better, across every metric that matters, people will go for it. Yeah, and I think that the beautiful part and the intricate part of modernity with Randianism, and, and I could be wrong about this, and I think uh, really kind of, you know, the, the left type will not agree with me here, but hopefully the, the problem of externalities built into all this and integrated into whatever sort of conscious capitalism is emerging and there's like becoming a reputational need to be the kind of person, the right kinds of incentives and pressures are emerging to be the kind of person who maybe arguably is careful enough not to, to have us all mitigate our capitalistic impulses there. It's so see, tricky. What's interesting here is this, and this is, a, this is an admission and a convergence that I find. I think it's probably more tacit in Rand, but uh, you see it explicitly stated in Uh, the Federalist Papers at a certain point. To have a government that basically doesn't have to do anything, you have to have people who can govern themselves well. And many of Rand's antagonists are constantly decrying the need for continuous rationality and constant mental effort. They're they're bitching and moaning about it. Mm. But to me, a common objection that like a common objection is well you'd have to expect people to be rational agents you have to develop them into rational agency otherwise they're going to do stuff like uh pull off some tragedy of the commons bullshit Mm. but if you get to a point where people are behaving in a truly rationally self-interested way then externalizing costs to the commons ceases to make sense and in fact becomes an act of aggression Yeah, precisely, precisely. And it, 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 that is more or less, yeah, that is the argument for the minimalist state, that that right. notion of aggression is blurry enough that diffused, that well, uh, you know, I'm not sure the right way to put it, yeah, just like, you know, it's reasonable enough to believe that there's a diffuse a harm externality to the community that direct threats of coercion against you to not do that thing that caused the diffuse harm. It, you know, I think I still lean in the generally pure anarchist direction here at the end of the day. I would like to see systems in which that don't rely on that. Um, I feel I, like a pure an, I feel like a pure anarchist capitalist system could actually work, but it's got the the thing that I find funny is that that works probably on the same scale that pure communism works. 
Because at the end of the day, funny enough, they're the same kind of deal. They're the same thing. Individuals generating resources out of their own parochial good. People don't get that right. They're de right. decentralized, radically. Yeah, radically decentralized can give people poor value in based on their specialist or based on their specializations. They extract value in exchange. And it's voluntary all the way. In the anarchist capitalist system, this is done using a, using a money analog that is objectively valuable. In a truly communist system, this is done using social credit. That, yeah, well but said. But everybody has to everybody has to produce, and everybody can or everybody can thus withdraw from the system if everybody is contributing maximally to the point that there is enough or that there is a surplus. Right. The difference is that, in, that under communism as practiced, good behavior is punished by being heaped on with more responsibility. So you're not you're not volunteering your effort for its own sake. Right. Right. And, and that's yeah. where the, and that's where the philosophical move takes a nosedive. It has to be because it's something that you would be doing anyway, assuming you had the resources to do it. Hmm. I, help me understand the final connection. I was right until the end. Okay. So who's the, who's so, the use? So you're a, a socialist who doesn't have the incentive to produce as much due to the lack so, of... So a thing that you'll notice, and I think it's exemplified really well in The Fountainhead, actually, but the thing that, uh, that I, I practice myself is I try, to, I try to make productive use out of the thing that I can't stop myself from doing. Mm -hmm. There are things that are that are so deeply a part of who I am that they will emerge in whatever medium I'm working in. Seems so there's the art, there's creativity, yeah. hmm. but there's also the fact that it doesn't matter what context I'm in. If some if I see a suffering human being and they're having a problem, I want to help them solve it. My big thing is that I want other people to have more agency and choice in their lives. That makes me happy. Seeing that. How do we build that man and person. woman? Right. Seeing that makes me happy, and doing it makes the world a slightly better place, in my opinion. It's a world that I would prefer to live in where people help each other. Yeah, that's, I mean, honestly, that's one of the best, like, abstract heuristics for the most you know, meaningful, useful life. Like yeah. to attempt yeah. to to propagate autopoetic agency maximizers whose goal is to continue that autopoetic agency maximization process. Yeah. The machines could do that and much better than us when you put it the way I just put it. I mean maybe. And it's that's more that's complex, it's more subtle. That's a thread that gets missed a lot though, I think. Um that thread where it's uh Maybe this will help. It might do. So. Yeah. Let's see. It was, uh... Yep. I got it back. Hey, so, nice. A, a common criticism that uh, people will level it at Ren's philosophy is, well, it promotes people basically being totally unethical bastards. It's like, that's not the case. You're a human being. One of the things about being a human being is seeing other human beings be happy feels good. It, it, it That's comes what up Malice constantly. points out all the time. It comes up, yeah, yeah, in the book? Yeah, in the book. It comes up repeatedly. Uh -huh. all, of her noble, all of her noble protagonists enjoy seeing the happiness of other people. They enjoy seeing other people enjoying themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to solve the selfishness paradox that people point out. Is the quick? The th I mean, yeah. the, the the frustrating thing is the is the level oneness of the dismissal. It's like here's what I'm going to yeah. point out about selfishness and happiness, and what about this? And you lose Randians, and the Randians are you know at least at like level two, three, four in terms of busting out the subtleties and the actual discourse and the thesis, yeah, thesis and antithesis much. of this. I don't know, I'm not saying they've reached the synthesis and, or any of us well, have, but. 
Well, no, it's and that's the funny thing, right? It's like all the level. It's like a lot of the criticisms that get leveled at, say, Christianity or any of the other major religions or any popular philosophy. All of the refutations are like so, f- so babies first, whatever mm. it is, right? They're, ah, they're, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, I'm reading through this and I'm going, yeah, the, no, there's. It's not just like, okay. I actually wrote this earlier, and it's worth it's worth trying to repeat here. How's it? In uh, yeah, I'll try. So, in debate, in rhetorical conversation, there's a tendency to want to rip apart another person's argument, completely deconstructing it, removing a, removing all value from it. No, that's not. How dare you? That's not even true. A little bit, not even slightly true. Not at all. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> tell me day. about it. <laughs> I can't, I can't. So, really, there's an attempt to straw man. It's a common tactic. It happens. And then there's this counter practice that gets proposed called the steel man. And I think actually the right move is to go what we could term burning man, which is a combination of the two. You steel yeah. man the parts of the argument that are in line with actual reality make them ironclad you see in them things the original thinker didn't even see Uh, look for you look for connections that they didn't make find new applications make it branch out see just how fucking good it can be at its core and as you do this if there's any contradictory element in the straw man of the argument that a straw man arguer would exploit you set it on fire burn it away so you're left with a steel core. That's yeah, yeah. It's so funny the straw and uh, steel having taken them at their literal. Um, that's beautiful. I, I fucking love that. Yeah, that would give Peter Lindbergh a boner, for sure. He lo- <laughs> he loves that. He I mean, if you his so yeah. He, so here's my suggestion: clip this or clip that and send it to him later. <laughs> <laughs> On it, on it, boss. You're welcome, Peter. We'll cut it here. <laughs> Thank you. Though. That was uh, that was an interesting bit of extemporaneous philosophizing. Uh huh. Uh huh. No, that's really uh, it's cool. The reason I really liked it that uh, it stimulated me to think Peter Lindbergh would think it is so cool is that like it implies an even more interesting and honest and. Uh, and honors the competitive spirit of debate in dialogos and dialectic in that um, you both I agree, wanna, yeah. you both agree symmetrically to burning man each other so you get to hear what it yeah. sounds like to have somebody do that to your idea intentionally and you can go through that emotionally and intellectually and see spiritually. yeah and so I it's really try powerful and get so excited about somebody else's idea somebody hey. else's argument i want to try and get so excited that i won't let it suck ah yeah that's that's right for sure for sure it's an interesting meta like it's a weird meta move you have to but you have to first be able to adopt their perspective Mm -hmm. enough to see enough to see what they see in it Mm -hmm. and that takes some that takes work i think yeah we can try that with the the climate the anthropomorphic i can play the uh the skeptic here which is my my in intuition i would love to be convinced that there's enough evidence of that but and you know, it's interesting i did do that earlier in fact come to think of it in terms of like i intentionally was like okay i'm gonna straw man your argument here or do the straw man of what that argument is um yeah. but that's just because i'm too agreeable and if i want to say something mean i have to qualify it with a you know here here's me playing this role for a moment yeah but again that's what i think the really the the meta modern move is that you know play the role and then be able to bounce up to the level on that talking about playing the role and then not get lost in all the levels above that too uh too too infrequently which is you know better and worse but do you uh do you feel like you could compellingly uh compact the anthropogenic climate change 80 degrees in florida weird huh it's so All humans the funny fall, thing eh? is the funny thing is is if Weirder. i had to do it if i had to do it i probably could i could make an argument for anthropogenic climate change but because i find some of the science compelling 
some of it, some of it I think is actually fairly compelling. But it's stuff like what we're doing to what we're doing to albedos on Earth by uh, changing how forests are distributed versus where there's ice, etc. Like our solar reflectivity is decreasing mm. as a result of various things we're doing with industrialization of farming and so forth. We're we're massively changing that kind of stuff. We're seeing ocean acid or oceanic acidification become a serious problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we know that rainforests aren't the thing that makes most of our air. It's actually kelp beds that do it. So if we're killing kelp beds, then no amount of saving the rainforest is going to matter. It's the oceans that are really the problem. And I can see some of that anytime I go to the beach here. That's something that's fairly compelling to me. Living on a coastline as I do, I've seen it change over time. I've watched the water creep a, to creep up just a few feet from when I was a kid, huh. but it's noticeable. It's dramatically noticeable. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Those are that's that's solid, and that reminds me. I think I can still hit it with try a, a counter argument that I feel like I can I, I can embody pretty pretty hard. But um, that that reminds me of the Jim Ruddian and just the whole Santa Fe Institute and complexity world. And Jim Rudd's super super smart. Jim Rudd understands the sensitivity oh, of complex systems. He's unreal. He's awesome. He's so cool. And yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, yeah, great, great podcast. This is the Jim Rudd Show. Here. And, uh, he's got a good, great energy. Really cool. Disagreeable and and works with it, but also so meta that it doesn't matter. He can work into the same space of like seeing you know mm -hmm. what he is in a way and like he's, you know he's, he's and he's a gentleman enough that it's not like an issue um but uh yeah his just that sense of rec of remembering yeah millions of years of of this complex system unfolding into certain equilibriums that have to have tipping points that's a complex system to work yep. and to tipping points into runaway um you know uh yeah ne negative effects um i think and that and, and that's very large being yeah. you don't notice a cascade until it's already too late and you don't notice cascade until it's too late and you do more and then you do more damage by trying to do some other idiotic intervention into that yeah. cascade and and let the cascades cascade from there and i think that would be my first counter argument to eh, i guess i wouldn't be anthropogenic climate change but it would be to uh, I don't know I don't know here's Let's... the thing my argument with anthropogenic climate change is this it's kind of irrelevant whether we're causing the climate change or not it's kind of irrelevant we're noticing a warming trend it's doing or it's starting to have interesting weather effects on how we produce how we how we trade goods so if we can engineer solutions to this, then we should. Not because it's the right thing to do for any green cause, but because it's the right thing to do to maintain human industry. Yeah, which, yeah, maintains and, yeah, human and, values. Yeah, and additionally, if we know that dumping tons of carbon monoxide into the air from cars is ruining the quality of breathable air in heavy urban centers. Yeah. If we know that's a thing that's happening, then why why wouldn't we want to fix that? If there's a way to do it. I mean, that's just pleasanter for everybody. Yeah. I think that is the case. I think my concern would be then that if that strong energy of let's see what we can do is there, that the current insanity of like general consensus reality, at least from my point of view regarding uh, how the institutions function to turn um, <laughs> ideas into whatever version. Well, and this is, I think this is, it, to me, I'll throw man that into carbon tax. And I think there's, then there's still 95% of things that aren't maybe from my perspective, at least, and, and I, maybe this is the right thing to do carbon tax. I don't even know. I'm not even going to try. I don't even want to say for sure that uh, there's not a right way to do that. At least, like, like even the ideas writ broad, like just the the implementation of these, are, it's really, really hard. I don't for agree me to with carbon. So I don't agree with carbon tax, but I will say, 
why not do car- or why not incentivize carbon capture? Mm. So would like you would incentivize mean government a- money into incentivizing or Patreon funds it? Either way, I don't care who funds it. Mm. My suggestion is that carbon ca- or captured atmospheric carbon can be used to produce manufacturable goods. Set up a market for doing stuff with the captured carbon. You can make fuel out of it. You can make dry ice out of it, if nothing else. Right now, it you can- Functions as a refrigerant. Interesting, so. yeah. Right now, you can donate money to carbon capture in which you're paying for a charity who uses machinery to pull carbon out of the air. Yeah. You can pay, you know, whatever, a couple dozen bucks a ton or whatever it is. And that might be, you know, your charitable cause. Astro uh, Codex 10, Scott, Scott Alexander, uh, I think, uh, advocates some of these kinds of charities as like reasonable effective and altruism here's, things here's the thing i would love to see i would love to see a manufacturing process that can uh, dissolve that captured atmospheric carbon in such a way that it can be converted into graphene on a mass scale hmm interesting that seems that seems plausible to me given the newer manufacturing techniques for graphene Interesting. It basically and takes any carbon source dissolved in water, converts the whole thing to a plasma, and then the platelets condensed out of the plasma, mm-hmm. which is cool as frig. I imagine, but, uh, if you're right, that the right material science experts and engineers are, you know, sliding I into that only hope. Edison uh, light bulb, like, you know, it would happen really eventually hope. direction. Yeah, because it's it's literally it's spinning one of the strongest materials we've ever found out of thin air. That's cool. <laughs> that is yeah. That's a that's a, a that right that's there cool. is. <laughs> that's a good corporate logo right there. Literally spinning, strong one of the strongest materials we've ever had out of thin air. That's cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, the plausibility of it is well beyond my means of of assessment. How far as, far as, I under- as far as I understand it, the physics check out, it's just the practical realities of the technique. Yeah. Like, the, what physics are the, are, the physics are known. What are the, the potential needs and uses for the graphite? Say again? What are the potential needs and uses for the graphite? Okay, so graphene is... Graphene. Uh, right. Yeah. Very different. Graphite's pretty brittle. Yeah. Yeah. Graphene... So far, a lot of stuff like adding it to organic polymers or adding it to other compounds like thermoplastics seems to make them absurdly strong Mm -hmm. at a great reduction in weight compared to what they would normally need to be. So I saw a guy manufacture a little puck of uh, probably uh, high density or ultra high density polyethylene. It's the same stuff that milk jugs are made of, basically. Uh, infused with something like 10% graphene by volume. And this was graphene as uh, graphene oxide nanoparticles. Distributing that evenly through the plastic and then press forming it into a plate. Uh, They took that and then shot at it at a firing range. And it's bulletproof. Really? Yeah. At something like less than a quarter inch thickness. That's absurd. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, it creates it creates weird carbon bonds with the rest of the polymer and reinforces it along its oh, bizarre lattice work. That's the and craziest the weird thing, thing I've is, ever heard. If you give an aqueous solution of it to spiders, it apparently does the same thing to their produced silk. It gets into the or it gets into the glands, works its way into the proteins, and bonds with the proteins in such a way that they become considerably stronger. Very. It's the weirdest shit. It also allows paintable or printable circuitry because it's electrically conductive. So literally, circuits printed on thin films of plastic. Complicated circuits are possible. Mm -hmm. Um, There's been some research into into semi-transparent solar panels. Uh, Basically, they're tuned to take advantage of wavelengths of light we don't see. So you can have windows that are collecting solar energy from all the wavelengths we don't see and letting through the ones we do. I've created an image of vortexing graphene streams going into some sort of large, uh, like, train, uh, you know, it's cone-looking uh, looking contraption. 
And yeah. I must have convinced myself that I that I understand how it all works. But the applications are uh, that's pretty fucking uh, far it out. It also makes backwards. really weird supercapacitors. So there's a there's a thing that's an alternative to a battery called a supercapacitor. Um, they uh, they have a bad habit of going kaboom if you short circuit them. But other than that, um, they charge at basically as fast as you can dump energy into them. Hmm. Which is not the case for lithium batteries. The right. problem is manufacturing them at scale. So if you have a hybrid system of lithium battery and supercapacitor, which some companies are trying with smaller batteries, you get five minute charge times for discharge rates of hours. Because they can just charge as fast as you can dump energy. Yeah, that would that be a game. Bad habits. Right. That be would... a game cha- it'd be a game changer for the electric car industry. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. How much energy or how complex is the process of going from what, I'm, what is it, carbon dioxide and some other things into the graphene? So the way that I'm envisioning the process, right, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, specifically as carbon dioxide, is basically just a question of condensing it down, getting it cold until the carbon dioxide just precipitates out of the air. That's a cryocooling process. It can be run on solar power, actually. Not very efficiently, but it can be. Mm-hmm. So once you've sucked all the, or once you've sucked carbon out of the air as carbon dioxide, you can then, I think, dissolve that carbon dioxide into water. And the process that I'm aware of, and I'm not real familiar with the details, but the process I'm aware of for making graphene on mass right now involves taking carbon sources dissolved in a, or dissolved in water. And then just dumping a ton of electrical current through it to form to immediately convert the whole mass into a plasma. Everything you don't want tends to bond with the hydrogen and oxygen, and the carbon precipitates out as graphene nanoplatelets, little single atom thick hexagons of carbon. And they're in the water, and they're collectible. They will be inside. Yeah, they'll be inside the ch- or inside the reaction chamber, and they'll be collectible as a precipitate powder afterwards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and scale is like the problem at the moment. It's doable, but it's so like far, tiny. You know, doable in yeah, a lab with tiny. Yeah, it's doable. The physics are doable. It's just scaling mm-hmm. it up now. Uh, we just do- don't have infrastructure to do it yet. Right, right, right. Um, right. So how? Yeah, is this? So this has been kind of understood at a chem- chemistry level and physics level forever, or for a while. Yeah. Even. But yeah. it's a technology issue. Mm-hmm. So that's probably it's been like, somewhere in a sci-fi book. This idea has to be, uh, you know, oh, no, spun, out, spun out a little bit. Well, here's an example. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, I think, back in the '60s, uh, came up with this idea for was called a or what got called later a bucky ball and it's a deliberately manufactured carbon molecule consisting of nothing but these hexagonal faces you can stuff something inside such a ball we've succeeded in making them but they're hard to make but that's where you get things like carbon nanotube technology from which i'm sure you've actually heard thrown around before carbon nanotubes exist we can make them it's just hard to do it at scale Bucky mm. balls, we can make them. It's just hard to do it at scale. Mm-hmm. But when you do that, you get some of the strongest materials we can, or we get some of the strongest materials physics predicts should uh-huh. be possible. The hexagonal stuff. So, yeah, down at this or down at the atomic level, uh, we're talking about carbons arranging themselves in kind of a chicken wire fashion. And yeah, 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 yeah. Just absurdly, absurdly strong, strong stuff. Materials. Yeah. Yeah. And is that found anywhere in nature, these like perfect carbon? In as a couple far as you of know? places, I yeah. think. In a couple okay. of places, I think you see naturally occurring nanotubes, but I can't remember where. But anytime right, you see it's carbon, th- Right, yeah. it's three-dimensionally um, yeah, stable exactly. in all orientations. Oh, right. Yeah. Now, you do see carbon exhibiting strength like this in things like diamond in nature. Mm-hmm. But... 
that's never been really practical to make massive structures out of because diamond is also extremely brittle, believe it or not. It's very, very hard, uh, resists a lot of different forces on it, but if you smash a diamond rod with a hammer, it will shatter. Right. Right. Whereas the nanotubes might even hold their form, even then. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And graphene uh, is the, so how do you go from graphene to the nanotubes? That's the problem. We can make the graphene, but not form. No, them. that's, it's, uh, I'm not sure you make nanotubes out of graphene, but it's all, okay. that's starting to get into a level of specialization I just don't have. Right. right. I, get, do you have any... I get why, I get why the physics work but I don't know the processes to make them happen like at a nuts and bolts level. Right, Not what was your them. experience or learning or what got you interested to even have the knowledge to, you know, theorize on this kind of, kind of uh, this can do that level of physics? Just paying attention to the development of metamaterials. Uh -huh. uh, so metamaterials science is the process of engineering new molecules, new materials that can do specific physics things that we want done. Mm. Uh, so for example, polarizing filters that let only certain wavelengths of light through. Uh, there's been some development of stealth technology that's basically metamaterials tech. Uh, when you do, when you're starting to talk about things like Kevlar or Teflon, you're getting into metamaterials. You're deliberately looking at physics to make new compounds that have specific properties you want. Uh, a really good recent example is the development of, I think they're called super hydrophobic coatings. Their uh, their water repellency turned up to eleven. I think it hasn't not been turned into a TV late night infomercial, this technology. <laughs> Jugu! Yeah. Keep your... Yeah. Never Wet is uh, right, one right. brand name for this stuff. Gotcha. But yeah. And I mean... Yeah, and those works. are last couple years developments. Yeah. And that's interesting because yeah. that's uh, all on nanotechnology. It's space yeah. stuff. I mean, the fact that the graphene, though, by itself, when mixed in and just randomly diluted into milk cart material, can yeah, at 10% turn it into bulletproof at a quarter inch, yeah, is yeah, specifically, insane. Specifically, high-density polyethylene is one of the thermoplastics that you could do this with, I think. Hmm. I, um, I want... Right. And that's HDPE, so any plastic where you see HDPE with the little recycling symbol on the bottom, it's that it's that stuff basically right but if you apparently if you take this material and distribute it throughout the volume and fuse it together into a puck the carbon starts to form bonds with the thermoplastic in such a way that it reinforces the entire structure mm. it, also it can also reinforce concrete which is weird but they've done some tests on that. And it actually structurally affects the concrete around it in the same way as it does the carbon? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's weird. It feels magical. Interesting. Gotta yeah, look no, that. this stuff feels like friggin' Chemical X, okay? When yeah. you start looking at the possible applications, but because it's carbon, it bonds with anything carbon bonds with. <laughs> All right, here's a prediction that it won't be uh, too many hundreds of years, some science fiction speculation for me, that using those, and I wouldn't even say I'd be the first one to think of this, and it might be a terrible idea anyway, and all that being said, you take the graphene printed circuits, and to make them really tiny, you fold them up fractally in whatever way the physics of electricity allows you to still do. Yeah. And you could fit a huge amount of computational power now in, you know, I mean, just doesn't even matter. It almost becomes space unlimited if you can figure out how to make a manufacture. That good luck to you um, <laughs> in the process. It just, depends, it just depends on your print resolution do, at that do, point. Will we even need, will it even be relevant to cram that much power into the, that tiny space anymore? Will we not already be that efficient or like we not at a good enough zone already where innovation is just like, I mean, you wouldn't need that kind of innovation to get to like, a, you know, a uh, Doc Ock kind of suit with four arms right. with that level of uh, sophistication and control. So possibly uh, applications yeah, are not there. Yeah, the only thing with Doc Ock is the actuation and power supply. Um, I'm pretty sure that with the, right of, with the right amount of machine learning and the right amount of dedication to learning to read motor signals from a human body, <laughs> that's, that's doable. 
it's getting the actuators and the power supply small enough. I'm mm. pretty sure. And those are really hard, like mechanical problems based off material physics limits. Like we know the strongest Precisely. materials we get our hands on, we can machine them as tiny as we can. Maybe we. Uh, it takes that kind of atomic precision to make something that uh, strong exactly. and reliable enough. Yeah, that's that's an insane world when we're when we're doing that. In but the but the stronger you can make your parts, the tinier you can make your mechanical devices. The small, yeah, precisely. Precisely. The more force you can pour through a material, the smaller you can get real real impacts. So, um, let me see if I can figure a practical example of that. Like. One of the one of the big limitations on motors is just how much energy you can pour through them, how strong you can get the magnets, right? So the smaller you can get the wires in a motor, but of a of a sufficiently strong conductive material, the more power you can dump through that magnetic coil, the faster you can get a motor to spin. So finding new materials that are more conductive than copper but can handle higher current loads lets you build motors that can do more work at a smaller scale. Right, right. and you know what, funnily enough, I mean, the, uh, let's try a little, oh man, but, but sweet transition. And you'll notice that nothing in nature is made of like basic elemental compounds. Like your nerves aren't copper wire. That's not accidental. If copper wire were really the best way to transmit information electrically through a system, that's what nature would have evolved. That's uh, profound. Yeah, there's a... Uh... I don't know if that's that's really wonderful. I think that may be the case. And, I, I, and you're probably right for the reasons. I, I wonder if one could gather enough copper for such things to be the case. For example, as a, but totally, totally yeah. aside, totally aside. The um, the yeah, the the point is is heard and understood. It is. Oh man, I totally beat changed my way out of uh, out of my. Really, uh, really wanted to have like, oh, good, really interesting. I thought reaction. It happens, it happens indeed. indeed. And you do have a you do have a worthwhile counterpoint there. It may be the case that we can create better than nature, but the thing is, nature's been throwing science at the wall for so long that a lot of stuff it's just got better solutions for than anything. Okay. Can yeah, yeah, totally. And for more subtle and complex reasons than we can imagine too. So we could say probably yeah. wouldn't be made out of copper for a bunch of reasons, and then for a bunch of other reasons, well, it very also reason couldn't be. Your, yeah. yeah, a very good reason to not make your nerves out of copper is that it's hard to find. Yeah, a that was going to be my first make, objection. Yeah, a very good reason to make your nerves out of uh, any molecule that you can spin together out of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen is because those are the four most abundant things in any environment anywhere in the universe. <laughs> Carbon, yeah. hydrogen, oxygen, no. and nitrogen everywhere. The, yep, the general uh, distribution and quantity, relative quantities of these basic elements is for sure one of, gonna be one of the most uh, yeah. interesting and profound constraining and unifying aspects yeah. of the logic of like the physical oh, and informational structuring of life. No. You can't you can't do copper on nerves because it's too raw an informational structure as well. Like it's just too, yeah. Too what? Too direct cause and effect. How do you have a turn off? Oh yeah, you're good, you're good. Just ponder the rhyme sublimely in time. Don't find yourself on your hind legs. Entirely pacified, quantified. Instantly gratified, except not a dilettante. Cotton on, what the shot know? Bot, rotten tomato. I'm bot, eating a rotten tomato, yo. I go bleep, 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 bleep. And then that tomato, I throw it at the stoop, like it was poop. And then you droop and snoop away, like Snoopy. Drink your soup, soupy. Poopy, poopy, loop. I already said that. Do pay attention to the question. The connection and retention, election, protection, section is not profoundly pretended to be a perfection. Insurrection was Sorry not for the interruption. Point. Not a problem. Not at all. 
I was interrupted uh, by someone running to a store, and I happen to need something. So, nothing wrong with the little multitask. Multitask is mom back from uh, the, the long trip? Uh yeah, she got back. Uh, she got back a couple of months ago. Right, right, right. Okay. But gotcha. uh, yeah, it apparently uh, changed her outlook on a bunch of stuff. It's been a lot easier living with her since she got back. I, She's much I, more helpful. I, in the sense that at least from this end, I couldn't have noticed when she got back. I'm like, man, now it seems like it's pretty cruising. Mom must still be away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 props That's, to you and, and to her, I guess, for uh, coming back a no, little bit. Obviously, there's coming been, back a little cooler. There's been yeah. a lot of. Uh, there's been a bunch of really stressful things happening over the mm -hmm. last couple of months, but. Like I've been, uh, I've been hunting for a new car, for a used car for a while. I finally found one that was a pain in the ass. Not having transportation for oh, like a month and a half was also a pain in the butt. Uh, but yeah, just stuff. Yeah, yeah. Just life stuff. And then I get the used car, and a week later, the alternator on it craps out, and like. I feel like suddenly I can't catch a break, and then my friends, yep, uh, yep. who are get, who are a bunch of gearheads, buy me a damn alternator for Christmas and install it. Oh, <laughs> that's it. And I'm like, and I'm like, what did uh, I do? And how do I do more of that? Just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a buddy put in an alternator for me. I paid him for it, to be fair, which is how I, how I like it. But um, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's that's really great. That's great. Well, that can and, be the done. Thing about it is. The thing about it is this, right? Clearly, these people think that I confer some amount of value into their lives that's worth dumping that amount of value back into mine for. Mm -hmm. Clearly, right. there's an exchange of some kind happening uh, here. It's just not monetary. Okay, can we just please all of us, humanity, synthesize the um, in a, our and acknowledge our, connect, our co collective inability to actually differentiate between altruism and self-interest with the there's, there's like a, yeah, the honest, real look, humans. There's a genuine blur because we get happiness from others, and we know it. We're all smart enough to do that. Like, I we can't pull these things apart. Actually, in some, I mean, people, yeah. For for fuck's sake, at the end of the day, anything that you value, anything that you place value upon, is because it makes you happy. You're getting some kind of a payout from it. At the end of the day, right? It's doing something for you at an emotional level. Whether that's something on an emotional level is based on, okay, you're feeding your body, you're nourishing yourself, you get to live another day, good for you. Or seeing this other person feel good about being alive makes me feel good about being alive. Both of those are values. We're, They're just different points on the hierarchy of human need. We're not it comfortable. I know. A need. It's really hard to be comfortable with that radically divergent possibility of perspectives and how those radically different values manifest as radically different ways of being in that different humans yeah. can choose that and that it's hard for the even the, the coolest of anarcho-capitalists and anarcho-communists to, I think, drive those, those in together. Sure. I get that. But like, so here's the thing. You would consider a therapist as offering a valuable service, yes? I am one of those people, so. uh, to the tune of 130 bucks an hour, to the tune yeah, of he charged 190 to his new people, sure. yeah. Assuming that they do so, assuming they do in fact provide a valuable service, you would consider it valuable. So, what's the gain that you're getting out of it? They're not paying you to sit there, you're paying them. So where's the money that you're getting out of that? Where's the material good that you're getting out of the service that you consider them to be providing? Uh -huh. Material good is in your increased capacity to function as a human being by taking their experience and using it to resolve your problems. The material good is deeper understanding of yourself. And for me, the material good of the paying part is that psychologically relieves me of the burden of feeling asymmetrical in the relationship in that it is indeed yes. about me and my problems and not and him and his life. And what you're paying them for? What you're paying them for is the massive amount of time it took them to acquire all of that experience that they're conferring onto you. 
For sure. And and in addition to that, which is very important, I think uh, empirically in client therapist relationships is just genuine like like sense of friendship and likability. Yes. Like if you were my very therapist, much. like it would work in the sense that you know, we like, I the just association like association would be completely voluntary. If I were a therapist in that realm, I would be doing business with only the people who I thought I could help and wanted to see made better by what I can give them. Right. That would be the ideal world. I would right. turn down patients based on whether I could be of service in that way or not. So it would be voluntary on my end. I could turn down their money because I'm not the right person for them voluntary on your end because you need to see a therapist but you should have some preference about what kind what their yep. personality is like yeah yeah and, and I, yeah the, the exchange of goods is being a therapist like that is very hard actually <laughs> it's tremendously difficult work it's mostly done out of love and if you don't feel like your therapist does it out of love you're yeah. going to be in, in trouble. And I think most of the therapists genuinely do, at least mine, I, I get that strong sense of, he's really like, uh, yeah, he doesn't like to have attention on himself too much anyway. And he's self-aware enough to get that that works. Mm -hmm. He has a helper energy. And he's also, to be fair, a very yeah. diligent, you know, person in, in all the important ways. That's not easy and give him credit for that. Just being, I have much yeah. more respect for therapists than I do for pill pushers. Ooh, I like it. I do too, except I really love Scott Alexander. He's a good advocate mm -hmm. for psychiatry and its yeah. benefits. Look, there's... Okay. Let's better do, living through chemistry. Man. Better, man. better right. living through chemistry and better living through voting. I actually made that argument uh, the other day, by the way. Somebody was uh, bemoaning the fact that so many people just refuse to vote for whatever reason. I'm one of those. And I'm like... And I'm like, vote, okay, look... The problem is you get too tied up with national politics that actually don't do anything about your quality of life. Not really. The way to get the way to get involved and see actual results from your volition exercised in democratic will is to do it locally, do it as close to home as possible. Every year that it came on the ballot, I voted for medical marijuana in Florida. And now I'm a user of it. This is a direct possibility that exists only because I exerted my will at the ballot box. Yep. Within the constraints of the system that could be innovated in ways that allow for the will of the people or the relevation, the rele the relevation, relevation, the revelation of, uh, by the state of it, maybe thinking maybe it was ethically, you know, inappropriate in the past or wants to, wants to change. So either way, there could be quicker ways to make that happen and maybe more, uh, yeah, I, I really like, yeah, I want to summarize that with a lot of the, I think a, hu a great um, synthesis between a lot of this, and we've come to this before it flows, and I feel like this like, connects me and Gordon pretty well, which is this like localism idea, and Taleb mm -hmm. talks about that a lot. So as you keep it hyper-local, you can do anarcho-communism really well hyper-local, you can do anarcho-capitalism really well hyper-locally, and like yeah. being, yeah, informationally global, but, um, but uh, resource space for you to live your life as local as possible. Mm -hmm. Like those two things. Yeah, I'm really get. excited about things like micro generation too. So like having yeah, small keep... devices dumping current into things. Like mm. this whole idea, is, this whole idea of local global, like oh. cellularization of units contributing to a larger system. Mm -hmm. What's mm, well that? Yeah. 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 And, is, and the natural so organization of those, in terms of organs as a metaphor, organization yeah. of those into yep. systems and however they then find a way to work together and have informational systems that link all, all them together, nerve systems, immune systems, vascular systems, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I think the yep. human body metaphor hits me over and over again, it's better and better or ways well, to think about the biology metaphor generally. I know, it just it feels like since we're the tip of biology and like, after us from what I have we can this, tell. I have this weird suspicion theology. that biology is kind of fractal that way. Like biology is one instantiation of a pattern that works at many scales. I, That's a thing that I think might be the case, but I'm not sure about I, it. I think it's, I, it, it resonates. I just want to hold on to like this. I feel, I sense there's something very parochial about our kind of consciousness. It's really, really hard to, to disidentify with. I and don't disagree that, with that. And well, yeah. leaping back on consciousness for a second, I'll also be the first one to tell you, psychiatric meds do a lot of good for a lot of folks. 
Mm -hmm. They do a lot, like a lot of medicine does. Medicine broadly helps people. That's what it does. When it's practiced badly, it hurts people. I'm one of the people who's been un who's been asymmetrically hurt by medicine. So my own inclinations are to trust my judgment and to learn as much about the field as possible so that I can have agency in that arena. But other people who don't have the time or inclination for that, broadly it helps them. I don't have a problem with that. I recommend people talk to a doctor who can prescribe if they've got a problem I think is that serious. Mm -hmm. It's not my realm, but I yeah. will absolutely point people in that direction if I think that's appropriate. Yeah. And was there something previous to the thread? I feel like was a, a continuation of thought before I hit with the localism slight side chain. That was that what I just said was a continuation of the thread that we were on before the localization and globalization concept. Right, 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 right. I think okay. the I think the problem is like this is something that's really emerging a lot for me lately. I notice very much that there are, there's an there's an expression of an idea that's just really faulty and bad for some reason but that the positive expression of that same idea also exists if you look really closely they're they're the same thing but motivated just slightly differently you've tweaked one little detail and somehow you've got polar opposites like i had an example in my head and i completely lost it frick <laughs> Oh, God. I hate it when that happens. It but goes like, sometimes. Okay, no, actually an example, we've already discussed one. The notion that anarcho-capitalism and anarcho-communism, both if you take anarchist uh, capitalism to the full objectivist, big O objectivist perspective, if you zoom that all the way out, it actually looks like a completely voluntary society with uh, everybody pursuing their own their own interests and the best interests of everybody around them. Okay, to me, the literal See, only- so you get, there's just a little twist there, but you're getting the same end goal. But one way you're getting it in misery and the other way you're getting it in splendor. And it's like, it's yeah. weird. And to me, the actual only difference between these two utopias in which we've stopped yeah. being collectively insane and started thinking in terms of just practical risk which means to live locally because the world is unpredictable right. and right. things happen and and information would be globally because why not take advantage of everything the difference to me is literally whether or not this world has something like a functional currency unit i would imagine a singular you know bitcoin-esque decentralized you know emergent uh, coin that's based off of ledgers and consensus and pure transparency and accountability and as much privacy as people want all the all the beautiful things that can be with the uh, the decentralized ledger world. Um, so the other thing that this actually solves this idea of uh, thinking as locally as possible. There's a frequent complaint, and I can see this complaint working out in this way. That if you let the best of us be as productive as they can possibly be, nobody else will have jobs. If you extrapolate technology out to its maximum productivity, the realm of the realm of influence that are in which people are necessary for making the basic necessities of life move forward, like you just don't have enough stuff for people to do. But if everything is community oriented. Everybody can make crafts. Everybody can can perform artistically. I know. It could be so, so beautiful. It could be so beautiful. And everybody could be free to enter, you know, have as much and, understanding and of all their that choices. Means, all that means is that the necessities of life are so abundant that you don't really have to contribute very much in order to afford them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the opportunities for the kinds of contributions that are in alignment with your preferences at a really deep level, at whatever level, yeah aligns with your values, preference stack, however you think of it, is also, it can be so abundant as and well. And you'll nice see- to have a world where people have time to actually grow up and learn things, you know, really become useful people. Because one of the major objections we have right now is that we have a completely irrational population. Well, of course we have a completely irrational population. 
Look at our education system. Look at our family dynamics over the last 50 years. I know. I know. It's so strange. And there's some this weird, like, I, I sense a tide of complicit of to me unfortunate complicity around these things with covid in that like the, even me i feel like you know it, it makes sense like statistically like there's good arguments like kids being out of school these two years giant mistake it's gonna and, hurt them huge and will hurt them huge socially. and will hurt them hugely socially and it's like and it makes the school into this like oh okay wait what's going on so school is better than home for well obviously in our current situation so the, it needs to be culturally or within the you know average parents understanding of their choices that the market has created more interesting and, that's and that's beautiful educational choices twist. it's another amusing twist so we were you were you were remarking on this earlier how there's this huge problem with people understanding what real altruism is compared to real selfishness and i've been musing on the notion that selflessness is actually worship of death for like the last day or two. Hmm. But if you Rand would it, love that. Rand, some yeah. serious. No, that's that's her that's her thing, yeah. With, yeah, no, she does say that. that there's some shrug. there's something deeply, deeply true about that, and you need to understand that in terms of if your impulses are deeply, deeply like Well, I don't know. I don't wanna look. I mean the um the, the Captain America archetype of the kid whose only quality is that willingness to jump on the grenade, like that yeah. weak, insane bravery, like that doesn't feel like something, that feels like it's something I'm now deriding and I don't want to do that. I want to, I'm not sure what okay. to do right now. But the other thing is, there are points in the, there are points in those books where characters express a willingness to annihilate themselves if the world can't be as they would wish it to be. If the world, if they can't envision a world in which they can be happy and do it or, and live their lives as they see fit, uh -huh. they would prefer to annihilate. That's great. So the truth is, I think that uh, I can't remember Captain America's name, but that he, this Steve the, Rogers, Steve Rogers, right? The the right psychology to imagine for him might be he couldn't imagine living in a world where he didn't jump on the grenade. That yeah. once, that's what happened in his in his being to have him do that was his inability. That's a really beautiful he values, way to think about that. He values the possibilities that are, that are represented in the lives of others. In the save, right? In the in the live save, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wants to live in a world where someone will jump on a grenade for the sake of the thought of other people living their lives. That's he's you know to go to war for that. Okay, I think that's, we can now. And that's the thing. That's, <sighs> that's not so good. Selfless. It's such that's a good That's not synthesis. destructive selflessness. That can be completely selfishly motivated if you have that depth of understanding. And yeah, and, and, and it transcends the and paradigm if you motivate that, point. It that way. If you motivate it that way, if you frame it as totally rational self-interest, it, it makes me a happier, more productive, healthier person to live in a world where X is the case, where people are willing to do X. If you look at it that way instead yeah. of yeah. looking at it from the awesome. perspective of people can't do for themselves, we have to prop them up, they're really helpless, what can we do? If you look at it from that perspective, you just make yourself fucking miserable and you open yourself up to being parasitized. You're also not likely to jump on a grenade for them if you don't think of them as having that kind no, of exactly. radical potential. Exactly. Because if, if you take that rabbit hole deep enough, what's a human life? And that's what I mean by the worshippers of death. They're not worshipping death as a concept. What they worship, what they're in pursuit of, is a world where nothing changes, everything is stable, everything is nailed down and predictable forever. All things are certain and self-contained. <laughs> you know what's certain, self-contained, and stable? Yeah, death. Absolutely. Uh -huh. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and, and if that's your pursuit, even if you even if you're pursuing it for laudable emotional reasons, you're you're fucking up, man. Yes, and the, and, and the reason I think might be that it you're you can't look at the obviousness of your oh man, I fucking lost it. Damn it! Something about the obviousness of your paradox in terms of what is it? Uh, give me a second. I'll, I'll see if I can. Pull, pull it absolutely. back, but I really absolutely love love all of that. I think that's a really good synthesis of the like pathological ways to 
look at like each like the selfless and selfish arguments and then the transcendence of that and then how it's uh it it, it Alan Watts actually did it pretty beautifully in one of his lectures. He uh, illustrated that all of his apparent altruism was actually complete selfless, complete selfishness. Mm -hmm. And that's another interesting point that I've been remarking on as well, that whole lot. Uh, to me, and I could be wrong about this, but based on my religious upbringing, when you're, tr when you're being raised to be other-centered or selfless, then the problem that you run into is there's a tendency not to self-examine. Because why do you matter? Right? Mm -hmm. But in that absence of self-examination, there's no opportunity to, to develop depth. All you're doing is trying to get yourself to a point where you're stable and can function and nothing more. Right, right. Okay, I think maybe, maybe, yeah, the thought before, which felt much clearer, and now I'm not too sure it's the case, but at least I, I recall what it was, and I think it has some, uh, some validity, which is uh, the paradox of, like, you're, by, by attempting to reach uh, the, the, the appearance of stability in your world through structure of, uh, of like human yeah. living systems by attempting to nail everything down you kill everything you kill everything and you, you and you right, create something that can only fall apart you're moving uh, right there's something about the inevitability of one's own death that is so antithetical to that way of being and like yeah. it makes it so hard to be as honest with oneself as one can sense chaos and change and that death is within that subsphere like the fear yeah. of that being like the subconscious pull away from that this in is, the order this like is something kind of them together actually like okay so there's this there's this distinction that Verveke has made recently about the difference between the pursuit of immortality which you can't have mm -hmm. at least not yet as far as we know but and that is suddenly what i'm saying these things are yeah versus the pursuit of eternality. Oof, yeah. So so oh my god. That's funny. People are trying to people who are trying to become immortal are essentially kind of worshiping death. They're wanting things to stay forever the same. And that's a mistake. Hugely a mistake. This will lead to nothing but misery for you. But if you want to become eternal, then you have to pursue the inexhaustible within yourself and bring it out into the world in manifestation in some way. Well said, yeah, totally. And if you do, if you pursue that, if you pursue that deep capital S selfishness, getting involved with yourself, understanding how you work, what kind of a creature you are, and what it is that makes you the best version of yourself, and then making a world where that's the case then what you're doing is going to create ripples outward that nobody can predict the total results of at the end of the day. That's becoming eternal by dealing in the inexhaustible within you. That's a completely different pursuit because it doesn't nail anything down. It leaves everything up for grabs. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it delights in confrontation, you'll notice. There are several points in Atlas Shrugged that are really beautiful where uh, two rail or where a railroad tycoon and a steel tycoon are like talking to each other aggressively about uh, about freight rates and rates right. Of okay, wait. So and, yeah, and they would not have respected each other if they were being if they were capitulating for cost reasons or things like that. There's clear and obvious respect happening between two competent people battling it out over something they both want. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. That they both agree and on I've that a level, the game is fair. Or, and, yeah, and I've experienced that viscerally in the martial arts. There's nothing fun about fighting somebody who just can't even touch you. Mm -hmm. Except for maybe that first moment where you're teaching somebody a lesson about why they suck. That can be fun. You know, giving somebody a much-deserved comeuppance, let's face it, that can be fun. But just fighting people all the time who can't even touch your skill, that sucks.
That's awful. So what you tend to do is you tend to teach them so that they become good enough to actually give you a fight. Because what you want is a fight. You want the outcome to be uncertain. You go into this thing wanting to be yes. challenged. And the best of the negotiators in the capitalist world, there is some small subset of super high integrity, super into the game and in love with the game and for good reasons, kind of Randian yeah. archetypes. Of course, there's the slime of the slime in there too. It all, it's all sure, present in, in everything, yeah. But um, the thing I, yeah. about it is the slime are always externalizing the cost of their actions and eventually they become self-defeating. If not, if not as individuals, as organizations of individuals. Right. The networks have. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the, the key sauces to the market that I think can be a, a virtuous cycle of networking that can be really I like powerful. that virtuous cycle. I like that a bunch. I don't know if you coined that just now or nah, if it's so, just something that Nah, sense, virtuous but. cycle, vicious cycle as yeah. different ways of, no, that's, you know, that's, and that's, that's it. perfect. I keep thinking yeah. of it as upward spiral and not having a better, more, more erudite way of framing. You're gonna, it, virtuous you know, cycle is great. Cycle yeah, yeah, cycle. totally. Yeah, yeah. And people, it's, it's, uh, you know, what it's, else is, you know what else is dumb talking of things that, things like virtuous cycles. Have you ever seen the anime <laughs> Garen Lagan? I have not, but. Sounds interesting. I'll write it down. So, yeah. How um, do you spell real quick? I can't spell it. G G U R R E N. Oh, okay. L A G A N N. G A N N. Got it. I was way off the mark. Yeah. Garen Lagan. Cool. It's it's extremely campy, but it's actually also deeply philosophical. So in places it's very over the top, but it starts out in what is in like a literal instantiation of Plato's cave. And the whole two seasons of the series is nothing but a philosophical exploration of the concept of the virtuous cycle versus the concept of the vicious cycle trying to nail everything down and make everything predictable. Mm, well, that's a really interesting way to s summarize what it is about those different cycles that make one virtuous and one vicious that's okay that's yeah that's what you're saying the whole time which is a that's a good way to connect those for sure yeah for... so if you wanted to think about it a vicious cycle is in service of entropy yeah it's trying it's trying to just evenly distribute things out so no possibilities exist whereas a virtuous cycle is trying to fight entropy creating more possibilities of interaction making it in line with my conception of agape Man, is it, is possibilities, how useful of that is a metaphor? It really, it is almost perfect if I think, if you can extrapolate far enough out, just in the sense that like, if the thing you're gonna do, like, okay, I'm thinking about possibilities and like, well, I can create a lot of chaos. There's sure a lot of possibilities in that, but like ultimately the kinds of possibilities created by chaos are all the kinds of possibilities that work less in the direction of maximizing possibilities. So any any chaos is never as effective as focused effort at producing a specific outcome. It's not, and of course it has its. There's enough. It has has its place, and it absolutely it, it shakes systems and, up, and yeah. Well, like one of my very favorite sayings from I think it's Hinduism is that perversity is the nature of nature. Mm. The whole thing, the whole thing nature does, the whole thing reality does is constant turnabout. It's constantly trying to flip things on their heads and make good things come out of bad intentions or bad things come out of good intentions. So being conscious of that is a way to focus your effort more effectively. Knowing that you will always have unintended consequences that may actually thwart you means you're on the lookout for them. Right, so the obvious the... ones don't catch you. Right, 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 right. I've not considered the, uh, the, I mean, I have in certain senses, but only in just like the radical, uh, yeah, it's tricky in everything is um, in terms of the nature trying to make bad intentions turn good as a correlate, <laughs> which is an interesting intuition and makes sense to me at a, at a lot of levels. I've well, not it's, quite thought if you about remember it. Our last, if you remember our last flow, me and Gordon got on this great sweet riff, and I think Sabo got in on it too, on the notion of your traumas becoming your superpowers. That's an example of perversity in nature, anti-fragility. You expect that if you hit something, it will break, not get stronger. 
that all yeah that resonates okay but to me it seems so and i'm with it and i and i can and the polar is fine and like i yeah you know in a sense you can like meet evil with a smile is one way to look at it from this from one perspective yeah because it is so um it's an so, interesting christian perspective there's a verse in the bible suggest or is saying resist not evil which means don't oppose it directly but jujitsu it basically Hmm. Take that which someone else intends for harm and work it to good if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the sense that you're bad, Mr. Evil fella lady, uh, gives the opportunity for good. And again, this is one way, it doesn't feel, it feels a little campy framing it this way, but whatever. Gives the opportunity for good to, um, to attempt to, I don't even know. I don't want to say attempt to interfere. Eh, I, if you, I don't know. There's You can think of it at like a cosmic game level. Like you need roles to have certain interactions yeah. that allow for certain developments. And just for, mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard to. Well, you hard. used the term enabling constraints earlier. I think that's perfect. The right. rules of the game are the enabling constraints that allow the interactions to happen. If mm -hmm. all you've got is chaotic soup, where everything's free to bounce off of everything else, then nothing ever congeals into anything solid. You know, uh, yeah, it's man. It's all I, just one homogenous mass. Uh, um, yeah, and but I'm once really... You, once you import an enabling constraint of some kind, things start to dance, things start to jive. And I think the, per the ultimate enabling constraint is, again, this notion of things can in fact interact in such a way that more interactions are possible. Right, so I keep having this like Boston Marathon, like exp like um, being the like, the just the, you know, parochial instantiation of the content my mind is thinking about going back to it. I keep flowing through different yeah. like senses of like, okay, obviously like it blows up. It's this horrible thing. It's all this pain, all this trauma and, and ripples out all yeah. this trauma. And they're like, well, trauma makes people grow stronger. It's like, well, it can, it might, but what, to what extent it did it. Um, for me, it was yeah. obvious that like it, it leads to less possibilities. More trauma is more, um, is more embodied intensity that that asks the being for uh, unwise manifestation of that energy. Yeah. Um, See, I think I know where you're going with this and I actually yeah. agree with it. There's a thing that happens in new thought churches where like, there's this common saying, everything is either a blessing or a lesson. Mm -hmm. But this is not the thing you want to, this is not the thing that it's kind to tell someone if they've just gotten a cancer diagnosis. It doesn't make any, right? right. Yeah, this is not, so this is not the thing that you In, want to encourage people to, to with, like. If, unless if you're the kind of person of you think yeah. wants to hear that, which is pretty yeah. fucking intense. And I don't think anybody yeah. does. I don't, I don't, <laughs> don't do that shit to me. <laughs> so like, so like, you, you don't want to come up to somebody who's been through an act of terrorism and has been Especially deeply malice, yeah. wounded by this and say, but you really should find the silver lining to your situa situation. Look on the bright side. Like, how trite is that? But the problem is, so that's trite. exactly what you have to do. And yeah. that's, where the, that's where the apparent paradox lies. That's exactly what you have to do. You have to look in any situation for your specific locus of control and figure out how to turn it to your own purposes every time. That's what's that's what's required of you to continue living on this planet. Uh, it's just so non-preachy, which to, is what I love yeah, about it. And the ability to just accept that, like feel your feelings, do whatever process you need to do to get a, to get that emotional energy under control. But the sooner you can acknowledge, okay, how can I use this? Is the correct attitude to have? The better off you generally will be. Uh, I know it's just, it's I wonder to what extent it's so interesting too. like the you know the beautiful the unbelievably subtle beautiful intuition of Steve Rogers that like yeah. I can that's one of the most wonderful notions I've ever not what I've ever but it's really hitting me hard that like I can what Marvel's really subtly saying I think at, at least the level that people whatever wherever we're at like 
resonate with that subtle idea that he is he can't bear to live in a world in which he didn't allow for the possibilities of others to continue when he could have yeah. prevented well, that's that the thing what does captain america stand for freedom to blow yourself the fuck up to save your friends that so that they can be free to live their lives because yeah. that's what makes you happy that's what you value ultimately is and people being what, free right that's what's so interesting that's why we that's how i think america might subconsciously integrate those two notions of like freedom and self interest and pursuit of happiness with yes, like our cultural valorization yeah which we have that cultural valorization of the hero who sacrificed himself how can you not like and which is a thing like when is it appropriate like so there's this there's this quote um self-immolation oh, so is never appropriate and i'm like okay except when it is because self-immolation the, the destruction of little s self is actually the process of cultivating big s self yeah 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 Turning off all the dead wood and all the yeah. stuff people have stapled to you over the years right so immolation of that side of yourself is appropriate but when is it appropriate to to self-annihilate not when you're 13 which well, is you know it's kind of when you're 13 for almost not everyone when you're 13 but when for yours for the sake of the thing that you value which is people's freedom to live their lives or when the sake of something that you value is at stake then yes put your life on the line because you find the world not worth living in yeah without that thing yeah oh wow that's so that's really but you will too, never yeah. you will never know what that is in your world if you're not selfish as fuck if you're not really getting involved in yourself in the way that you think yeah and that's and, selfish yeah so 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 many great things there yeah that steve rogers so authentically himself that he subconsciously integrates all these beautiful like high-minded perspectives into it that it all happens in the moment when the bomb goes off um, and the other thing is, he's probably equally tortured by the prospect of people being in, being enslaved, being bullied around. He actively hates bullies. He's actively hostile toward any kind of tyranny over people. Yeah, yeah, and and it's the same possibility intuition. It's like, what are you doing, getting in the way of that person? Well, I think possibilities. I think if you love anything as much as he does, then there's gonna be an oppositional factor that you hate with as much passion that you seek to destroy. Is it the hatred be, of hate? Like, Does that work? I don't know. I think in his case, it's the hatred of tyranny. It's the hatred of people who want to enslave other people. Yeah. If right, he right. values freedom that much, then what, he, then what he ultimately hates is anybody who wants people to do stuff with a gun to their head. Right, so, and it doesn't seem too unreasonable to bifurcate off, um, liber you know, freedom and tyranny as the yeah cultural manifestations of the energies of love and hate from Steve Rogers' perspective. So, like, and I mean, the hate, hate really, idea works for him, although it's dangerous for most people. He is, yeah, and he represents that side. In Civil War, particularly, yeah, it's see, awesome. We see him being very libertarian. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. What? I completely agree with him on that point too, like. The problem, the only problem with libertarianism as a philosophy is that people aren't willing to take the responsibility necessary to exercise that kind of, the kind of liberty they want. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. I remember now, which I really, I just want to highlight how you pulled out the extra bit of Steve Rogers' intention in that, like, it's not only that he couldn't bear to live in a world in which he didn't save them, sort of like a self, like he can't live with himself kind of thing. But what you said, which is that a world without those possibilities wasn't worthwhile anymore. A world in which those, like those possibilities being gone. But that seems that, yeah, I that takes incredibly swift intuition because he has to be aware that there's all these possibilities getting exterminated all the time. And he's not doing anything to help them. But in the moment when he can, he chooses too even though he's he not only, necessarily yeah like again rationally you can only be where you can be you can only be in so many places at so many times yep and we all really you only really... have so you only have as much control as you have and there's no sense torturing yourself over the control that you don't have and i'm not speaking theoretically here i am in fact speaking <sighs> from practices that i try to employ i'm bad at it like every human is but seriously I know, and however the world makes people who are doctors who like regularly fly to disaster areas to do what they can, like 
that there's you know thousands of these, tens of thousands of people like do this like you know for whatever other pathologies they might have that i'm you know like that kind of uh because of energy point, to they help. feel like it's bullshit that there's something bad in the world happening that's making people suffer when they can do something about it so they do like if something keeps you awake at night that's a that's a cue as to what it is you value about your life yeah yeah but ambient works so well i've never taken <laughs> ambient <laughs> I've actually been on sleeping medication one time in my life, and yeah. I don't care for it. Gotcha. I mean, look, I, I pot myself to sleep most nights, so it's definitely yeah. Seven. No, that's that's fair. If we're if we're counting that, then yes, <laughs> because I reached a point where I couldn't sleep anymore. Like, really, sleeping was hard. Uh, but right after uh, right after I almost died in a fire, I I had a two week stint where I needed sleeping meds in order to fall asleep. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. And I think we might need a beat change. How's that for a segue? Sure. Let's see. I like it. it. Sounds like I want to grab a, make sure to grab a nice beginning part of the beat. None of these are my beats. Something else that I just love. The more that I think about the possible connections going through this, because like I said earlier, the way I'm approaching these texts from Ayn Rand is with the notion that no, she's clearly onto something because a lot of this resonates with how I was already living my life and what I had already converged on, just from experience. A lot of that is, you know, there's not even a question. But instead of being critical in that I want to tear things, I want to tear strips off of it and just deface it. No, I want to be critical in that it doesn't go far enough. I want to see what it can really do. I want to challenge it. And a, a thing that I notice, there's another quotation in the Bible, I want to say it's in Proverbs. As steel sharpens steel, so one friend sharpens another. Nice. And I think this means an important definition of the concept of friendship is somebody who pushes you to be better. Somebody who challenges you and delights in being challenged by you, I think is kind of critical. I absolutely love that, and yeah, there's there's a lot, a lot there. I think that yeah, the flavor of how that manifests can be so cooperative in some friendships, yeah. but it's still it's challenging in the sense that you both agree to be in this arena of challenge together, where you're both like yes. you know. There's no, it's not, it's not you, you don't have to be involved in a zero sum game to be at that level that what you're talking about in, yeah, I don't know, is it, it it's com, are you sticking with, is competition the word you, you feel, am I pulling that out of your mouth or out of thin air as the right word to competition hang this on? Is, competition is a perfectly good word, because that's exactly what it is. It could also be contest, but again, visceral experience from martial arts. I don't want to fight somebody who can't fight. I okay. want to fight somebody who can fight. Let's try. I want to fight somebody who can teach me something. Apply this to a tea party, which I feel like we can. I'm just it's yeah. the co the competition is way more embedded in there though. But it is I think so, at a structural yeah. level. But yeah, what do you think? So are we talking? So when we say tea party, we're talking like a social gathering with some kind of political significance or social social uh, consequence. No, very, Something very playful. To... Let's do it with kids. Okay. Kids are friends, you know, okay. and this stuff's working with them okay. to at some level. The competition is to see who can play the best. The competition is who can play the best. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, right. And you'll notice the kids who can play the best are the cool kids. It does have hierarchical consequences. That's, that's reasonable. It really yeah. does. It really does. And there are perverse incentives in there that can corrupt all of that as well. Like, and you you see it. I, I've made I've made this comparison, and I've really loudly denounced uh, it in a couple of circles. But the uh, kids don't well, know what the a, best is really. Right. Some of them into There's, the way into it. But yeah. that's what that's what play is. Nor play is we. finding that so, out. To, mm. Play is a completely selfish activity of self or of learning. So That's much what of it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, but the thing is, you literally <laughs> can't do it effectively without somebody else to do it with. 
you can't find out what your best self is without other people to help you to help you find it. It's not even a meaningful question without some comparison. No, so. without other human beings to challenge you, push you, give you direction, show you things you don't know about. It's not even a meaningful question. <laughs> yeah. And how is the like the lack of the really beautiful for me? aim of lack of exterior consequence to the games we play the game for there's a playing tennis my dad win lose win lose he's beating me at the moment which is awesome for him and i I would like to win i'm way better golf but he's uh incredibly moving incredibly well for a 60 year old man on the court it's it's awesome and uh but you know i i bet that this is the damnedest thing too i bet he actually sees things moving around the court better than you do Oh, for simply sure. Because yeah. he's, simply because he's more used to the mental gymnastics by virtue of raw experience. He's played way more tennis and walked around the world, and he's pretty athletic. So he's been in, you know, in his athletic yeah. body for the whole. So he's a he's a good challenge for you then, because he can push you. Yeah, and I can outmove him for sure. Right. Um, but not out consistency him, and not out, yeah. you know, outnumber him. Yeah. Um, but w- I w- yeah, I also want to want to like so at the psychological level with my pops in terms of like playing the game hard. But for me, I like to exactly dissolve the win loss after it happens. In terms of like, it just uh, it couldn't matter less. I mean, really couldn't. I play as hard as I can, and like whatever happened happened. Mm-hmm. And you know, pops comes from more of a world where like winning at least you hold on to it for a couple minutes. Or second, sure, and like, sure. we'll joke about it. It's really, really fun to joke about. And I'll play that, like, you know, I'll, I'll curse when I fuck up and, you know, and and show him if I feel like it in a competitive way. But ultimately, like, I really, really want to drop this and have, and my ultimate sense is I want this as endless cooperation play type thing that, yeah. like, in, again, to me, the competition feels very deeply embedded and maybe removed and maybe to the point where we wanted to integrate it's- with cooperation. It's super cool that this is also a relationship that you're having with your father, because one of the archetypes of masculinity expressed in father or in fatherhood is antagonism, but friendly antagonism, nurturing antagonism. Mm. And the way that you have antagonism of that kind, the way that you can have opposition that cultivates a relationship, builds up the other person, and the way that you can have a situation where where your win loss record doesn't really matter is when if you're losing you're still winning because you've learned i honestly almost get emotional if i'm really focused when anybody hits a really good shot i yeah. love it because i know my dad no, loves it's it it's beautiful to see that right and i know that like, his ego is much more in it than me and that he's really celebrating and i love that yeah you know? yeah and the thing is like for me a reason to just feel joy when i see somebody else do something amazing is because like that's cool that's what people are capable of i'm people Mm, totally how can how can i get there somebody just showed me some shit how can i catch up how can i be better to that level yeah when it's somebody who's close when it's somebody who's close to you in terms of ability when it's a good match this is encouraging it's a continuous rivalry you're right yeah 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 absolutely i really want to i feel like there's such a good integration of um selfishness and selflessness in this conversation to like all the levels down they come to at least for for me in a way that feels like they they come back around in a a new way and of uh competition and how competition as a reasonable archetype being, yeah, is like the, um, yeah, I guess like the, how does it work? The motivating factor for the Steve Rogers is not competitive in a, in a open sense. Well, you'll notice he's also, you'll notice he's also tough on people that he likes, that he sees potential in. He's a hard ass. He doesn't let people slide on anything. 100%. Yeah, well, he's so like, if he's he like, clearly, if I'm going to die for you, you're going to be your best self, is what he's saying yes, every exactly. fucking second. Yeah, which is... Exactly. <laughs> that's great. Like, that's that's what his life is screaming. Make it worth it, damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's selfish, in a way. 
It is. Right? Because it makes his world much more interesting to live in, if nothing else. Right. And but the counterfactuals he, are overwhelming for him at some level of either not yeah. worth it to be in or not worth it exactly. to be myself afterwards. A world, a world full of people who are worthless layabouts just receiving the government dole is a world that would horrify Steve Rogers. Yeah. It's a world in, he would want to... It's a world he would want to opt out of. Unless they were culturally enlightening themselves. We were culturally enlightening themselves. I don't want yes. to... I hope that we... Dead in, which case, in which case, they're not worthless layabouts on the government dole. In, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I do not imagine a world in which you can have non-worthless layabouts in which there is a government dole, but I'm open to yeah. that being wrong, and I'm open to there being a competent enough government, or at least something closer to that. And that I think yeah. as we go on, people naturally will be more likely to choose interesting and useful lives to the extent that not they're taken care of economically, although of course that's, that's a they big have deal, the but capacity the to, yeah. They have the capacity to draw from the world around them what they need to survive and pursue their happiness. In a minimally extractive way or non-extractive way. And hopefully yes. even, uh, so, even autopotically producing way. Yes. One would, like, ideally they want to contribute. They want to produce more than they consume in a way that that's, you know, in a way that that makes sense. Yeah, when we all... It doesn't make sense to materially produce more than you take on board, but it makes sense to be able to ideationally create more because ideas are what allows you to use materials in different and new and more exciting and efficient ways. Right, right. And create infinite ripples of informational possibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering. I'm having the sense of like, if the the here's the thing: the market is the best thing we got in terms of dollars as informational language. We've talked yes. about a lot before, but yeah. it's still it is very sorely lacking. I think even yet in that it's it's it misses a lot of values in a lot of ways. It does. No, I think it's going to be I hard for the caregiver to be as compensated in the. Yeah, the hyper free market. As again, I don't trust the state to do it and do it well and not do it and set up a bunch of perverse incentives as has been done. But some you want to know the reason that you don't trust the state to do it in this case. Uh, the reason that you don't yeah. trust the state to do it in this case is because the state is seeking to create state. They're seeking to create a status that doesn't mm, change. The state is creating to create state. Yeah. Wow. How's that? That wow. That state is almost like. And when you're coming from earlier developmental times in which the chaos seems such that you'd rather have a state than chaos and you don't have the possible wisdom to you know mm -hmm. see which new kinds of order can emerge from here the right hopefully right kind of minimally traumatic trauma inducing chaos um yeah and now making it's interesting it's also yeah, states have really made things... sense for a while i think they just don't well, anymore in a lot of ways so the thing is, you want some things in your environment to be relatively predictable. Like, you want to be able to reliably get the things that you need in order to keep living. So the more that you can automate that, the better. That's I agree more. Okay. But that's not nailing it down and killing it. That's finding a way to take those resources, invest them, and make them make more of themselves for you. And literally creating systems by which physical reality moves itself around in an order that best suits your perceived needs. Exactly. What you're and trying to do is- And markets move the cans on the shelves, yeah. man. What you're trying to do is create something that's essentially an auto-poetic means of production so that you don't have to think about it except for that initial investment of thought to set it up. And is that the- That's not yeah. killing something, that's creating life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The alignment of incentives or the, I mean, and, and these things have really emerged themselves before I think any smart person was like, uh, or, or you'll find the convergence of money. Money happens in some mediums of exchange, blah, blah, blah. This was also something beautiful. Because there's two points in this book, in Atlas Shrugged, that made me really think about something that's mm -hmm. a common criticism of industrialists and capitalists. Reardon, in the book, is talking about dinnerware, like tableware, forks and spoons made of Reardon metal that cost pennies and last generations. Now, normally, in our, in, in normal people's conception of economics, 
this is not how business is done. You don't you don't undermine yourself like that. You, you build in a you build in a, an expiration date on your product. That's but that's worshiping. Reardon yeah. has a possibilities make possibilities intrinsic mindset too. Yes. And gets at the making of forks and knives create the possibilities for more possibilities, and that's in his best interest ultimately. And it and it goes one further. Galt, in the creation of his motor that draws energy from static electricity, basically making machines that are self-propelling on air. He's created an unlimited supply of electrical energy. Why does this make why is this profitable? It's profitable because now you can give everybody electricity so they can use it to do things that electricity is good for without having to take much of their time to give it to them. So now they're free to make other pursuits and they can still give you enough to pursue your own. Right, that is such a non-zero sum. Exactly. Innovation. Everybody's thinking of Everybody who's criticizing this this philosophy of economics, I think, is criticizing it from the perspective of zero sum games, zero sum economics, or negative sum economics. Well, of which we apparently are caught in many of these traps. Oh, very much, very much. <laughs> At the moment, none I mean, of what we're talking about is actually capitalism, or communism, or socialism, it, or democracy, yeah. or any. It's all just corrupt no, and tropical. What we're doing right now. What we're doing right now is an economic death cult. Is an economic death cult for sure. Okay, so we're yeah, but, yeah. Uh, fair enough. But, but that's like, it. if you needed further examples of this, like, wasn't it a couple of years ago Apple got into this scandal for it being discovered that they, uh, with their software updates on older phones, they release uh, they release lines of code that make everything run slower until they're almost unusable, so that you have to buy a new phone eventually. It, my sure iPhone's a little this. bit of a buggy thing. It's it's a ten. It's there might be a truth a connection to what you're saying, and um, and, and I believe I'm sure it's demonstrable. This isn't speculation. And yeah, that's absurd in terms of the fact that that's not a, a company ruining revelation in terms yeah, of no, our acquaintances as consumers. And of course, and you know, again, things next to me on the table, so it su su yeah. su suits me right, whatever I get. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the thing also made in China uh, in whatever conditions that we would also find abhorrent and it's well, just so hard one. to organize the energy there, you know. The destruction of supply in order to regulate demand and keep prices in place. That's dumb. It's a practice that's common in our current market. Is this something, it's not, okay, why is it not something random? And I think I can answer this myself, but why is this not something random missed in terms of the incentives built in? And why is this a result of the broader meta structures where markets are, you know, embedded in all these other things that help and hurt it, you know, in so many ways? Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not actually sure where it gets missed or where it doesn't, but the, the thing that makes the most sense to me, the, the way that it, the way that my brain is kind of taking this right now, is uh, the right thing to do as you increase your capacity for production, like at the same amount of resource consumption, is to decrease the price of your resultant goods to make them more widely accessible to a populace because you now need less from each unit produced in order to sustain or increase production. Mm -hmm. Fairly si fairly simple math, I mean, I would think. And, and obviously creates the bottom line increase, which is the innovation, which is the incentive for that to go down. And yeah, and you... the thing that doesn't make sense to me is why then would you do anything else? Because you want something that's not real right i don't know yeah what is it about there might be some asymmetries in the corporate... thing that's the thing that's burning in my mind on this is the fact that the mm -hmm. tiffany mines in africa the diamond mines they actually burn a certain amount of diamonds mm -hmm. just to keep the prices up mm -hmm. that's yeah that's ridiculous to me this is ridiculous to me just to artificially maintain the value of diamonds to destroy supply 
It almost feels like that's a level in which the there could be enough wealthy network collaboration that that kind of thing doesn't make it to the news in that like, and even if it did, I'm sure you can find, I shouldn't say, you know, I'm sure you make find something in the Washington Post about the De Beers Diamond Cartel in the mines and, you know. Sure. I, or, you know, I don't want to blame the news for not giving us enough information to act, you know, honorably yeah. and, and not do this collective thing where we say, suck it to this insane practice. Um, also, I wanted well, to add- you know what they say, yeah. if it bleeds, it leads. In the journalism world, mm -hmm. like, so there's this, there's this great band that I that I listen to, Starset. They have a track that came out this year called Infected, and the chorus of it is, we do it one by one, put our hands up and run, we're addicted to the panic. Nice. Starset? The way the, yeah, Starset, S-T-A-R-S-E-T. Uh -huh. Good. And the song is Infected. We do it one by one, put our hands up and run, we're addicted to the panic. And we hate the way this world has become, but there ain't no cure for it. We've been infected. It seems to and sum it like, up at the moment. At the moment, that's exactly what it seems like. Like, people have just given up on the possibility of ever impacting anything meaningfully. And that's a world in which there is not enough rational, self-interested agency for people to start enacting systems that benefit them instead of grat just kill them more slowly. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the, as part of the meta crisis, we can look at all the cultural things emerging from which causes is a, a important, but won't get into now. That move the, like Verveke says, often the agency sphere into more and more simulated yeah. spaces and yes. less into impactful places and that the asymmetries of impact i mean seem to so continue that we have to... a whole generation of people whose agency consists of whining to an adult to make it better oh and whine loud and with some serious snarl because you mean it and you're angry and you're not totally sure yep. why but you know this is kind of like how it gets better and yeah, scary and, yeah and then you took social media throw that into the mix so now people can cry really loudly directly and, at the adults <laughs> the so-called adults who are really just crying children themselves in all likelihood oh boy yeah you the kids are not wise enough to know the adults are kids themselves because yeah. they were raised by said kid adults uh-huh uh-huh uh -huh. i think it's it's up to our generation there's no <laughs> there's this little pocket of like five years in which you're not well, what's interesting, is that, what's interesting to me is that I have a lot of people in my life that are about 10 years younger than me. Yeah. And all of these people 10 years younger than me are so fed up with the bullshit of my generation and the one before mine and the one before that. So millennials, Xers, and boomers. They're so fed up with our crap that they've started valuing actual skills doing things themselves religiously rather than paying somebody else to do them and developing as much capacity to cope with the, with the physical world as they can there is a and i don't know if it's yeah. just i don't know if this is just a trend from that generation or if it's the kind of people i tend to attract now or both but yeah uh -huh. it's interesting to me that we're getting a generation that reminds me a lot of my grandparents generation which would I, be the silent generation I, because yeah, yeah. my grandpa was a hyper competent masculine kind of guy like really and all of my younger friends now value that kind of attitude they value that well let's get this shit done kind of attitude you know what I, that's really beautiful I, yeah I, I love that there's possibly and i could be wrong but some like, and, and probably less so than, I think but things are tough to make sense epistemologically right now. And the kids probably have some more consensus beliefs than are probably appropriate, maybe a little bit too gullible at the moment still yet. Could be. I could, could be. I, I think so. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty, uh, my world is, is pretty, pretty dark in terms of what the adults 
are doing. I don't think the kids quite catch. I, and again, I don't know, I don't know, but I, I want to really strongly agree with you in terms of their practical and pragmatic ambitions and skill learning, and that is being the ethos and that being the most important thing, and that the ideas, I think it's up, you, they're going to embody these things. It doesn't matter. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think the reason for it is that a lot of these younger people have come up in situations where crying for help did nothing. Damn. Except maybe get them laughed at, which is exactly what happened to my grandparents' generation, if you think about it. Growing up in the Great Depression, if you wanted something, you better go get it. <laughs> All right, just don't if be too- If you want it to happen, make it happen. <laughs> All right, fine. Just don't be too harsh and judgmental at the gen soft generation after you that's enjoying the benefits of your, you know, quality- No, I'm- leg absolutely. Not you, but you know, just the, the kid. Yeah. The, the, no, I agree with you. Because that's what the grandparents the did that we would like them not to do when they produce the same awesome stuff with their hard work is all, you know. Yes. So. Yeah. We would like to end that cycle of hard people, uh, hard generations make really, really excellent worlds that breed soft generations that breed because, hard times. Yeah. Yeah. To, to we would extent, like to break that cycle and just have really excellent people living really excellent lives, yeah, if at all possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to the extent that the hard people can break the resentment on the soft people is partially, I think, to the extent that they'll act in ways that allow the soft people to become, everybody becomes a, a nice, you know, appropriately textured, tuned, uh, adapted. So I think there's probably yeah. a way to titrate that hardship in. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's probably a way to not have a world that's in a state of crisis that produces really excellent people. I feel like you could instead deliberately create hardship that would produce good people. Hunger Games in real life. No? Too far, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. But like, but like, the way I grew up was, you know, being allowed to do dangerous things as a child and being expected to do competent things as a child and being shown skills, being given opportunities to learn and develop skills in particular. Mm. Like, my grandpa turned me on to the possibility that picking up trash can get you money as a very young child. I became aware at the age of five that aluminum cans could be, th or that people just throw away, could be cashed in for money. Mmm, we got lucky in that our grandparents didn't extend their resentment to their grandchildren. They just gave us all the good stuff. So my grandpa had his own scrapyard for scrapping heavier things and raising chickens. Nice. And, and he would let me go, he would deliberately just chuck the cans out into the scrapyard when he would drink a soda and let his grandkids come around and pick them up and take them to cash them in. Instead of just giving us money. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, come get I some money. <laughs> I don't want to throw this shit out. I love that, that's great. And y'all took here. him up on that, I presume. Oh, all the time. We He made it a game, it was fun. Yeah, It was sure. like hunting for Easter eggs, finding all the cans in places, it was crazy. That's a oh, dope grandpa. He also, he also took us camping a lot. Mm -hmm. Camping involving fishing quite a bit. Also involving learning how to use a camping stove, start fires, raise tents, where to put the tents, how to pack the tents away when you're done with them, how to make lots of stuff fit into very small areas. <laughs> Mm. And with that, let me let you know that my grandpa passed away about five or six days ago. That's why my mom's in oh Florida my. right now, in fact. Oh my gosh. And I didn't I'm know him quite that. as well. Yeah, yeah, it, it, there's, it, it's for sure. It's, he was, you know, he was an 85 year old man. And uh, yeah, we're sad to see yeah. uncle. It's not, it's not fun having un uh, grandpa Joe out here, for sure. And my mom, like there's a lot of, you know, I'm, talking to her a lot and she's she's down in florida and there's there's is definitely some like the things are with death are, are here for sure and i appreciate that for sure. um and yeah not it's uh, yeah i'm i'm much more in the i feel in the caretaker position right now yeah than the grieving um but there's 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 moments where i'm really appreciating the the ability to to touch into some of that stuff but um yeah yeah the grandpa the grandpa thing is uh it's interesting. I am going to think more about grandpa love and what that that's. I, I know grandma love really well. Grandma's been in for, sure. forever and she's still around, which is cool on my dad's side. You know, um, what's really funny about that is grandma love for me was the same thing. She just taught me different skills. <laughs> um, 
So wild blackberries are a thing here in Florida. They're very commonplace. So it was fun for kids to go out and pick them. And then grandma would teach us how to make things with the stuff that we gathered. So she would she would uh, teach me how to make jam or preserves or uh, actually pie also. I know how to do all of that specifically because grandma was babysitting and uh, that was how she was babysitting. Mm. Here, come help me make this. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you like picking blackberries. Well, here's what you can do with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. like are these both on the same side? Them. Mom's or dad's? Yeah. yeah, that's mom's side. Cool. Um, dad's side, similar people though. Um, just different, different arenas of really, really shrewd behavior. My dad's parents were both in real estate, uh -huh. but they also had the practical skills thing. Yeah. So grandpa, grandpa on dad's side, he had chickens, he kept a garden, he kept bees, which I always thought was really cool. Um, he taught us, uh, he taught us archery and marksmanship as kids, taught us how to build fires. Yeah. Great. Um, same kind of thing and grandma kitchens on that side was always wise with the uh, philosophy about money in particular she's very economically savvy and would never just give you money she would make you work for it yeah i wonder i wonder to what extent we're seeing that like hard generation soft generation hard generation cycle thing happen which is a, always a little tricky mm -hmm. Chris, because generations aren't really a thing there's cohorts and there's waves but it's mostly just people being born all the time Yes. Um, but even even like, that said, yeah. Like, based on my timeline, I'm, I'm in the millennial generation. But based mm -hmm. on my culture, I'm much more I'm much more Gen X than I am anything like a millennial. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of the grandparent grandchild relationship that in that, and then I think a lot of the hard generation having all these skills that they, you know, your parents might not have even been taught those at the time. They were too busy trying to like make money, things, and not, mm -hmm. you know, not quite in grandparent mode. So that's, uh, yeah. So we're, we're, I want to say fortunate to be in the uh, the time and place around, but of course there's truths and untruths. That, but fortunate oh, to have I, the grandparents and be in touch with them. That's cool. All around. I presume any anybody around every still. Day. Say again. Well, anyway, are these uh, fo are these grandparents around now? Uh, my dad's mom and my mom's mom are still both alive. Oh, okay, cool. With the grandpa's but grandma on mom's side is like 93 years old. God bless her. Uh, grandma on dad's side is in her 80s now. God bless her too. Yeah, and they're. They're still feisty. Uh, mm -hmm. My grandma actually took up painting after grandpa died just to have something to do and has gotten quite good at it, actually. Ugh, that's great. I honestly don't have any role models who do like anything creative she seriously found something to in do my with family. When she couldn't run her antique shop anymore, and it's oh, great. That's great, yeah. That's cool. It's so nice when like you sense people are able to kind of take care of themselves to connect to mm -hmm. things earlier. Like, how easy is it to love them? And, you know, it goes both ways. All right, let's mellow this out. It's 10.06. Okay. We've gotten through about five beats. I did record this. I don't know if I brought that up at any yeah. point, but you must no, have I'm, been aware. Yeah, it must... I, I saw the notification. I'm aware that we're recording. Well, and I, when I realized you were, that... yeah, that Peter Lindbergh will catch our uh, our moment. We shall force him to. I'm a patron, goddammit. Watch this two minutes. I'm gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I should, you yeah. know, I should join. Um, I, I really should, as a New Year's resolution, I should just do fucking collective journaling at 8 a.m. That would be a really. He does it every fucking day. Just like I, that would be a sick practice to get. I <laughs> know. To be, yeah. uh, be. I should just commit to that for like a month. It's just crazy that I don't. Just that. I actually 8 a.m. Say that early. Just get up. Get on the computer. Set yourself up the night before. Yep. Just, do what he says, journal. So what I'm trying to do is make sure that stuff that's important gets done before I leave my house every day, which means I've got to cram it down into about a three hour period. Um, but for the uh, collective journaling thing, I actually was attempting for, uh, for Advent to write every day. 
and then um, about a week before Christmas, uh, mom got a scam call and some <gasps> asshole remoted onto her computer, and oh, so I had, no! to, I had to spend a and so I had to spend a week uh, waiting for the opportunities to clean up all that stuff, nail Are everything you back down, wow. reset the router, and that just threw off my whole my whole flow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But now you get into at that point. I was doing pretty good at posting. Yeah. Something. Nice. Okay. Cool. Oh, is this on what on the Patreon? Yeah, that's on my Patreon. Nice. I've got okay. a bunch of new posts up there as a result of that resolution to try and post something every day. And it turns out I can totally do it. Uh -huh. So there's no excuse now for me not to. Hey, Just... you can uh, <laughs> take take the New Year's resolution or whatever uh, whatever flavor of that works for yeah. you. Um, yeah, yeah, try try for that. I'll try for the collect journaling. Yeah. I got it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to try and put anything <sighs> I consider a chore up front in my day so that when I get done with everything that has to get done, I'm free to do whatever else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I've been, yeah, yeah. For me, the best days, the ones in which as quickly as possible, I simply go on my whiteboard and write down a big to-do list. Once yep. it gets written down, it's almost yep. magical that it will happen. Mm -hmm. It makes it yeah. or like, you know, put on body Breakfast lotion. Breakfast is usually making a checklist for myself for the rest of the day, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> this is really, yeah, there's another way to, that's such a powerful, powerful move, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if it's not for breakfast that I'm making the checklist, it's for dinner the night before. <laughs> That's Those are the awesome. better days. Yeah. Those yeah, are the yeah. better days. <laughs> yeah. When no, I then wake you wake up knowing exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Those are good days. Mm -hmm. I feel that. Yeah. When I, I wake just... up and it's just kind of aimless. Eh. I know. I just have a life without consequence. And <laughs> I'm really into the music making right now. So if I don't do anything, I think I'm supposed to do my ritual life. I still recently have been spending six, seven hours in the basement smoking spliffs and working on tunes, which is really good to be doing f in, for my spirit and is fun as fuck and is I mean, justifiable. I'm doing, but I'm still I'm really, doing the I need graphic to design equivalent. Yeah, I'm sitting. I'm I'm sitting here in my uh, little spot all day, doodling things and listening to intellectual material. So, like, I'm doing the I'm doing my equivalent of you smoking spliffs and noodling around in the basement making beats. Right. I'm noodling around in a sketchbook and listening to people's ideas. But that's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the it's... kind of work that I do. I yeah. design shit and I help people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so long as I'm, I think for me, just being a little, getting, you know, I just, I had a ritual, but getting back into a ritual is like viscerally very, very difficult. I just need to acknowledge that. No, it that is, it is. And get, get wrong. The, my body, my, my kid spirit wants the freedom of spontaneity so hard, just like forever. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, I could feel a sense of a little bit, the, the self, like, like, dude, bro, come on, or whatever that, like, is something mm -hmm. that, um, is, uh, is it's feeling, something cyclical feeling. I notice actually. Like I'll have periods of yeah. time where I have to sit and soak things up, and then I'll just have explosive moments of serious productivity. Yeah. And I think it might be, I think that might be me being bipolar, but I think there might also be something very real and human about cycles of productivity and having fallow periods and then productive periods. Mm, totally. I really like the uh, New Year's. Um, just on New Year's Day, go to the do make sure to be a collective journal. Like if uh, Lindbergh will be there, if they're doing it, and I think that will be enough. To, you know, I'll just do that and I'll see what happens. Won't force himself to do anything, but that might eat, set set the ball rolling. I think would be. I'm really I'm not doing any organized introspection right now. Like I, this is some of the most introspective stuff I do and meditation. But oh that, that's, yeah, you don't write anything no, down. You really you really would benefit from having a more organized introspective practice. I, I often do it, have. I have tons of journals, yeah. but yeah, not recently. My, my default state is introspection, usually uh, in a sketchbook. <laughs> yep. So like doing it with other people is totally unnecessary for me, but I can see where it would be helpful if you're not already that way inclined. Yeah, yeah, just for the just for now and for the, the um, accountability and a yeah. little bit of structure. Um, but really just yeah. accountability and and yeah, yeah that'll i would think it of it fun. as enabling constraint actually the accountability is an enabling constraint for you uh, to do this yeah. thing you want to do yeah 
Yeah. And that's beautiful too because who likes constraints? I can like I can be okay with the not liking it because like of course I don't like constraints. I want you know mm -hmm. I want freedom, well, but I know that ultimately these constraints are in the service of greater freedom via possibilities in in, in the aggregate sense. It really is the part of myself that wants to transcend self. Yeah. It really is bent, you know. And if you think to yourself, nobody likes constraints. You absolutely do when it comes to playing tennis. You like that there are rules, right? I. You like that there's a game to play. What is it? Yeah, no, totally. I, I rec definitely recognize that. It's the. I guess it's the meta. It's the 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 temporal constraint of a of a right. commitment of a daily commitment. Yes. As a particularly un, as something I can recognize as the kind of constraint that I can see the certain parts of self will have some issue with viscerally, okay. and that's okay. Right. And it'll be hopefully, un, yeah. it'll be unpleasant for you to get up early, is what you're saying. Yeah, more or less, more or less, <laughs> and to no, go to fair. sleep on a... time to do that. Yes, that's and to not that's be too stoned when I go to me. sleep that it's not too hard to get up. But that's what yeah. I think that'll get make those those will be the enabling constraints that will be a little more. I'll be like when I have some impulse, it will now take a little. There will now be more of a automatic, uh, visceral, bad motion to that impulse because I'll know that impulse is not serving this commitment which has now been made, and I worry about the karmic impacts on other people's possibilities of me not showing up for a commitment. Oh, there's just some other person in the world who shows up New Year's Day and then doesn't show up after that. Kind of. I think it's also going to be a thing. In your case, no, I lost the thought. I lost that thread completely. Oh well, it'll come back if it if it matters. It, uh, no doubt, no doubt. Feel free to uh, hit me with it later if it comes back and feels so uh, so important. So I'll take all the help I can get when it comes to uh, you know enabling constraints. <laughs> yep. Oh, Thanks, uh, there it is. Yeah, nice. you'll find it a lot easier to get up early in the morning and go to bed on time if you have something to look forward to. Yeah. Just simply yeah. put, it's easier to get out of bed earlier if you have some good reason to do so. Yeah, and I, I, I will like being with a community more and a productive community and a sangha feeling yeah. vibe than no, doing I it think by that's myself. True. Yeah, like I have I have this thing I do every Friday that I call spin jam, and we're we're doing it this Friday too. We're doing a New Year's Eve party out of it, but uh, I almost don't get the flow toys out unless I have other people to play with anymore. Mm. So. Gotcha, it's yeah, very, yeah. But I miss it so bad if I miss a week. Mm -hmm. Like if for any reason we have to cancel or I can't show up, I, I, I really suffer for not being able to get out there and spin. Yeah. So that community aspect it. to it is is really a lot more significant than I think it gets credit for. Yeah. And I think a big part of being a rational self-interested agent is recognizing that you are a social animal and thus other social animals like you play a role in your self-interest it fits together pretty neatly and i feel like my self-interest has been served so much by continuing the flow commitment yeah. and happening happening to be the person who picked up the thread and keeps uh keeps it and i really appreciate that you did that to be honest i really appreciate that you haven't let it die <laughs> i couldn't live in a world where i didn't do it because it was easy yeah. enough to do it was easy enough yeah. to do and it was hard enough to imagine not you know not doing it and, and, and when me, tyson offered the course been, yeah. was and really for me organizing it would have been hard enough like it would have been enough of a challenge for me to do with everything else going on that i just wouldn't have i would have let it drop if it had been done to me Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I definitely recognize, yeah, that in terms of like time commitments, I'm the uh, I can, every other Wednesday we can we can pull this off. Benjamin, come on, buddy, and and we have, which is which is awesome. Yeah. And, and I'm uh, perfectly okay with that. I think every one of my Wednesdays would be too much to throw into this, but every right. other is perfectly good for me. Like it's it. yeah, yeah, and it just needs to stay alive. It is an awesome modality. I did sign up for uh, Buddhist Geeks has a social meditation training cohort. And so okay. that's like going to be a weekly commitment for 10 weeks, which I really don't want to do. But I think, again, I just got to hop on with these things. And they'll, they'll enable you constrain me again. For me, it's just not, it's getting too much well, time. If you, 
but yeah, uh, if you're otherwise not socially engaged very much right now, then you need to find something that will that will engage. Right, that and I am super socially engaged. I have the band, and I have copies okay. of all these musical collaborations, which is awesome. The right. family still present. I'm yeah, as socially engaged as I want to be for sure. Okay, but um, but these are the kinds of so serious play social engagements that I. You know that feel like they contribute in a really wholesome way to okay. growth and motivate. Yeah, that's good. You know, yeah, I think so. I will reflect my community. It's like almost inevitable, and so exposing myself to the highest caliber community, I can at least a little bit to the extent that I'm ready for it. <laughs> I think it's all, all to the best. All right, all right, and with that, this was a wonderful flowing conversation. Um, yeah, this was fun. Yeah. It's a good way to uh, wrap up the year, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really, I'll tell you that Steve Rogers thing. I'm, I'm going to make a diagram of that and show you. So I think that's perfect. Totally do. I totally think it's do. perfect. And I think, like, some of my favorite moments of our conversation were when we were doing, like, uh, commentary on specifically, like, some cultural thing. It wasn't like we were using it as an example. We were, like, unfolding it as the thing we were focusing our attention on. And we haven't done much of that. And I think we're both really well suited to... And, and it's the most communicable. It it, it gives us a, a, a big space to latch onto collectively. Steve Rogers is an awesome um, For sure. thing to unfold. And that that was really, yeah. really, really wicked, wicked cool. I'd love I to like unpack that. the. I'd love to unpack his counterpart sometime and do Iron Man. I'd be. I'd be very interested. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe next time. But yeah, we'll, we'll do that. But yeah, I think we had a good. Uh, I think we actually achieved Dialogos this time once again. So good. Amen, brother. Amen. All right, and with that. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good night. I'll see you in 2022. Yep. See you then. Yeah. Peace. Peace.